you've always been a champion for the environment and, and talk about why that's been such a keystone to your your campaigns and to what you've done in Congress during your career. Well, when I was a boy, um, my mother told me, don't swim in the Malden River, four blocks from my house. I'm, I live in the same house I grew up in right now. So it's still four blocks away. And the Malden River was black with a kind of pre-Jimi Hendrix uh, purple haze over it. And it had all these polluting companies right along the Malden River, coal companies, chemical companies that just used the river as a dumping ground. And when your mother at age 11 tells you, don't swim in the Malden River, well, I don't know if it's the word environmentalist, but it makes you very conscious of the fact uh, that companies are just using uh, the world that you live in as a big dumping ground. And that's where my interest in the subject uh, began and it continues to today. And the Green New Deal is ultimately just the, uh, the full extension of it because polluters are using the atmosphere as their dumping ground. Uh, but the consequences for everyone down here uh, is actually quite negatively profound. I found this poll interesting from the American Progressive poll that was taken uh, in the spring. And it, came, it, it broke down the favorability of the Green New Deal. 21% of the people polled were favorable of it. 26 were unfavorable. But yet a staggering 53% were unsure. How do we get that 50% or that 53% to get a favorable impression of something that is so critical in combating the climate crisis? Um, well, I think that this campaign uh, that I just waged uh, to, uh, uh, to win the Senate seat in Massachusetts has helped the political education on that issue. Uh, but I also think that the, uh, the fires out in California and Oregon and Washington, uh, the storms that keep shooting through the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the incredible wind storms going through um, Iowa and other states are all helping to educate people. And quite simply, um, the Green New Deal just says the planet is dangerously warming. There are no emergency rooms for planets and we have to engage in preventative care and we have to unleash wind, solar, all electric vehicles, uh, plug-in hybrids, uh, battery storage technologies, energy efficiency technologies in order to accomplish that while creating millions of new jobs uh, in our country uh, and doing it with uh, social justice, doing it in a way in which we're very cognizant of the fact that uh, black and brown communities have always breathed different air than uh, suburban white communities in America. And I think that the kind of the contours of that argument uh, are embraced by the American people. And now it's going to be our job uh, to put it on the ballot on November 3rd so that people understand how important this issue is. And then next January uh, to begin an impl implementation plan to make sure that we give the same kind of uh, tax incentives and regulatory favoritism uh, to clean energy technologies, renewable energy technologies, wind and solar, as has always been given to oil, gas, and coal, the, the causes of greenhouse gases in our, um, in our world. You know, I don't think it has, obviously, a lot of bipartisan support, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But I had a great conversation with Tom Steyer last week, two weeks ago, former Congressman Bob Inglis, that I've had in both in my series. And they said, not only did you win the, the Democratic primary in Massachusetts, the turnout was significant. And they said that that was the indicator that voters want climate change front and center. Uh, exactly. Is now, if you, if you, if, well, if you look at our, uh, our race, we doubled the turnout of young people under 35 year olds in Massachusetts. We doubled it from 2018 to 2020. And we focused very significantly on the issue of climate change and the Green New Deal. And, uh, and we showed that if you talk to young people who really care about this issue and explain that uh, if they participate in the political process that they can make a difference, then they show up. And so young people showed up in historic numbers. We had the largest turnout in a, in a uh, primary in Massachusetts history. 
I ran on the Green New Deal. I ran on the climate crisis. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of lessons for people there that this upcoming generation, they, they believe in the science. Uh, they know that the consequences are catastrophic for them if, if bold action is not taken uh, and that they're willing to fight for it. So, uh, so this election was really an, a very important indicator of the power of the Green New Deal and uh, the need for real action. And young people responded. And by the way, they inspired older people to, to uh, work harder in, this, in that campaign as well. Congressman Inglis uh, mentioned that the Lindsey Grahams, the your colleagues that scoffed at the, the Green New Deal, better watch out because their seats are in jeopardy because the young conservatives understand the gravity of this crisis. What message do you have for them uh, in, in surviving in the Senate when it comes to the climate crisis and taking it seriously? Yeah, young people are on the march. They believe in the science. Uh, they know that something has to has to happen. And especially if you live along a coastline, you can absolutely see uh, that these storms are becoming much more intense. And so from my perspective, uh, young Republicans agree with the science. And while older Republicans may want to still link to the oil, gas and coal industry, that there's a revolution taking place inside of the Republican Party with young people in the lead. And uh, and that over uh, the next several years, I think we're going to see dramatic changes in the way in which the Republican Party deals with this issue. And my hopes is that bipartisanship will break out, that science will prevail, and we'll be able to put these job creation um, uh, measures on the books. And by the millions, we'll put people to work installing this new energy technology. Do you think that 53 percent, and, and I think to get the full effect, I don't want to summarize what the president said. I, I think really to get the full effect, you need to you need to quote it. Um, so so here go two quotes. Um, I mean, they literally want to take buildings down and rebuild them with tiny little windows. OK, little windows so you can't see out. You can't see the light. Uh, he went on to say, our country will be a ninth world country, not a third world country. Do you think it's messaging like that? Look, I know that the the 10%, if you break down climate change, there are six Americans. The 10% that are dismissive are clearly the president's base. And you probably will never get to them. But do you think that the 53% that are unsure about the Green Deal are affected by this messaging and are confused by this messaging? Well, that would be the president's goal. But the reality is that using artificial intelligence uh, for the construction of new buildings, uh, the new materials which have been developed, uh, wind and solar, uh, energy efficiency technologies, uh, we can make these buildings two or three or four times more energy efficient than they've ever been in our history uh, and make them uh, light and bright uh, and uh, and solve the problem while we employ millions of people who are installing these energy efficiency, uh, clean energy technologies. And for older buildings, um, if we go in and we rehabilitate the buildings, uh, just make them more energy efficient, use uh, artificial intelligence to help us in that, uh, we'll be able to do that in a very relatively brief period of time, uh, dramatically reduce our energy consumption. No one will be, no one will be uh, hotter or colder uh, or have less light uh, in their building, uh, except that they will save uh, billions of dollars ultimately as a nation on their energy bills. So that's really the promise of the future. Uh, uh, the, the fossil fuel industry obviously spends a lot of money trying to... Um, confuse uh, voters trying to send out misleading lessons uh, about climate change. But from a scientific pers perspective, it's a consensus. It's real. It's happening. And we need a solution. And we can actually save all of creation by engaging in massive job creation. We can do it. And, right. uh, and so from my perspective, that's really the message that we're sending. And it's working without question across the country. So no tiny windows. 
there will be there will be bigger windows except that they will be more energy efficient and they might even have thin film solar on them uh, that will actually bring in more energy into the building but we'll need the windows to be larger so that we can capture more solar with thin film solar on the windows that will not impede the the view of anyone looking out you know and is 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 spending tens of billions of dollars in fossil fuel infrastructure putting lipstick on a pig in industry that is dead uh i I mean think about the money that we could be spending on revitalizing this economy could this still be the way senator markey that we turn this economy around that we're clearly have been put into a recession uh, over the last four years can your help us get there and and bring us out of this recession well the fossil fuel industry calls the green new deal socialism but the oil the gas the coal industry they've received um, subsidies, tax subsidies from American taxpayers, from from people watching this uh, interview right now, for a hundred years. So all we're saying is, give us the same subsidies on a permanent basis for wind and solar, all electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, uh, for battery storage technologies, for energy conservation strategies, and we will bury the fossil fuel industry within a generation. It's just not competitive right now uh, in the marketplace uh, to have a situation where all the subsidies go to the old industries and the new industries don't get the breaks which they need. And even with that, there's been a dramatic collapse in the price of wind and solar in our country, massive deployment, which has occurred, but it's still much slower than it would be uh, if we had permanent tax breaks that were there for those industries. And we would create millions of jobs. There's already 300 to 400,000 people employed uh, in the uh, wind and solar industry. Uh, and it's just going to take off once we put those permanent incentives on the books. And we're going to begin that next uh, next January after uh, after Joe Biden wins and, and the Democrats control the House and Senate. Now, you know, you go into Roxbury and you see some of the Roxbury Mattapan and you see these social justice communities that live in housing that are rentals and they're far from energy efficient. You hear the hum mm. of window units. The, the streets are hotter because of the urban heat island kind of uh, multiplying the, the effect of, of the climate crisis in these areas. Uh, what incentive do landlords have? They're cashing the paycheck, but yet some of these communities of color are spending upwards of 25% of their monthly income on heating and cooling costs. But what incentive do these landlords have? Or what do you suggest that we can t- try to fix that? Because they're, they're, they, they have every right to live in sustainable, energy-efficient buildings, but clearly they don't. Right. So, uh, again, people, in many instances, they live in old housing stock, uh, very energy inefficient. Uh, and so part of what uh, my plan is, is to have a, uh, an energy climate uh, bank. Uh, where uh, we will be able to provide super low interest loans to uh, to homeowners, uh, to landlords, uh, to just retrofit their home, to make it much more energy efficient. Uh, because obviously the tenant doesn't own the home, so uh, really can't uh, take advantage of those breaks. So we have to create a nationwide program whereby those who own these properties know that for a very low interest loan, they'll be able to completely uh, redo their building, lower energy costs uh, dramatically, make it more efficient, uh, and uh, cut dramatically the amount of greenhouse gases that are going up into the atmosphere. That's something I think that can happen on a bipartisan basis, because that will, will create millions of jobs as we look at the old housing stock in the United States. What are the imperative parts of that plan that, that you really can't negotiate on uh, going forward that we really need to get done. Uh, Fast forward to to January 20th. What does Joe Biden need to do when he hits the ground running? What are the top and first steps he needs to take? Well, it's across the board. We need to uh, we need permanent tax breaks for wind and solar energy efficiency. Uh, We need to increase the fuel economy standards of the vehicles which we drive using 
Uh, my law, President Obama raised it to 54.5 miles per gallon as the average for the American fleet by the year 2025. Obama's standards are being rolled back by Trump right now. We have to raise the standard to 65 miles per gallon, 75 miles uh, per gallon for the whole fleet so that we continue to incentivize the innovation in our country. Uh, we have to do the same thing with, uh, again, the incentive, the incentives that we create uh, in the industrial and the commercial and the housing sectors, uh, agriculture sector, so that they invest more in energy efficiency technologies. And we can, again, provide a, 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 an easy financing for each one of those sectors to be able to move very quickly to dramatically reduce greenhouse gases. We can do this. It's not, it's, this is not rocket science. Uh, this is auto technology. It's, it's solar, it's wind. Uh, it's, it's relatively um, simple. Uh, we have already had the technological breakthroughs that have transformed each one of those sectors. It's not a technology problem any longer. It's a political problem. Are we going to do it? Are we going to break the grip which the fossil fuel industry has had over our energy agenda? And I think this election and then the swearing in of Joe Biden is going to unleash that incredible revolution that has been long in the making. You know, the banks were bailed out by hundreds of billions of dollars. The airlines now, they're flying less, but yet they've been bailed out in the latest uh, stimulus. Uh, <laughs> how is this as an investment? If you look at the big picture and what we have spent money on in the past, how does this rank? Well, as an opportunity, as a job creation um, opportunity, this will be the greatest blue collar job creation initiative in two generations in the United States of America. We'll have to manufacture and install all of this uh, new equipment, wind and solar. We'll have to make all of these new uh, all electric hydrogen uh, vehicles that we drive. Uh, we'll have to have hundreds of thousands or millions of workers inside of our buildings, inside of uh, old housing stock. Uh, rehabbing it, increasing the energy efficiency. We'll have to train a whole new generation of young people. Roxbury Community College has a program uh, where uh, it is now training young people in, uh, in, uh, in solar and energy efficiency. And it's not just going to be a job. It's going to be a career for those young people over at Roxbury Community College because this is going to go on for some time. But we can do this. Young people want to do it. It's, it's where they want to be spending their careers. Uh, and if we give the same incentives to these technologies as we've given to oil, gas, and coal, we're going to have those millions of jobs that get created. We're going to do the job. We're going to save the planet. But we're also going to uh, make sure that families earn a good income and, uh, and protect uh, the most vulnerable communities, the, the minority communities, the frontline communities from the kind of pollution which they've always been exposed to. If the Democrats don't get the House and the Senate, um, how, what is the likelihood that, that you can make any headway on this going forward? Uh, that, is, that is an alternative that is incomprehensible to me. We are going to win the House, the Senate, and the presidency. We have, uh, we have a brief period of time, just a few weeks left to go, uh, but I can feel the momentum on uh, on this issue. Uh, we just can't allow Mitch McConnell from uh, coal country in Kentucky to any longer control the energy agenda of of our nation. We have to change leadership. And then once we do it, it's going to uh, be the same as what happened with cell phones in people's pockets. Uh, it, 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 it did not take long for people to adjust to having uh, uh, cell phones in their pockets, little mini computers, the power of, uh, of, uh, uh, of an Apollo uh, mission computer. Uh, and that all happened in 10 years. The same thing's gonna happen with uh, the renewable energy revolution once we get rid of the Republican leadership that has been blocking votes on the floor of the Senate uh, on this uh, incredible transition that is just waiting to take off.